All right, so let's jump in. So um, tonight, I would like to talk about loons and some of the challenges facing loons in New Hampshire. Once I'm done with that, you'll be tired of hearing from me. I'm going to hand it over to Caroline Hughes, who is our volunteer and outreach biologist, to talk about the Loon Preservation Committee and the work they, that, uh, that LPC is doing to preserve loons. In Good, so uh, I, I'm a biologist by training and in biology as in any other profession, the work that we do over our careers is always based on the work of others who have gone before. And in the world of loons, uh, one of those standout people certainly is Judy McIntyre. And Judy was a pioneering uh, biologist, did a lot of the initial work on loons. A lot of great work has been done since then, but much of it references back to that, that beginning, that starting that uh, Judy made on this. And, in addition to being a great researcher, Judy was also a little bit of a philosopher. And she referred to loons and their calls as a symbol of wilderness and the positive affirmation of wild things and wild places and wild sounds in the night. And loons really have come to typify the nature experience for many outdoors people. And there are good reasons for that. Uh, you know, these are impressive birds. One of the first things that we hear when people come into the loon center, they see our taxidermy loons and they say, oh, I had no idea that they were so big. And a full grown male loon in New England can be 15 pounds, sometimes edging into 16 pounds in size. Um, there's a reason I think why people don't recognize that loons are as large as they are. And one is that often when we see loons, they're out there floating in the middle of the lake. And there's nothing really to give us a sense of scale on those uh, for these birds. The other is, is that loons are very dense, heavy bodied birds. And so they float low in the water. And so like an iceberg, most of them is actually below the water where we can't see them. They have a striking black and white plumage. They have those blood red eyes uh, and they have these distinctive and far ranging calls. And my very favorite loon quote comes from a British researcher who way back in the 1950s described the nighttime calling of loons as a chorus from all of the devils in hell. And whether you love that sound or it sends chills up and down your spine, you're not likely to forget it or the bird that made it. And then if you add a little downy chick uh, riding up on the back of one of its parents and you've hooked a fair proportion of your population. And so even people who are not bird watchers, you can't tell the difference between a house finch and a house sparrow, they know and love their loons. And that makes loons a powerful force for conservation. So the pictures that we've seen until now have all been of the common loon. And as the name implies, that's the most common of our loons. It's the most widespread of our loons. And it's the only loon that actually breeds here in New Hampshire. There are actually five different species of loons. So this is the yellow-billed loon. The chief difference um, is its namesake, the yellow or the ivory um, bill. Um, and these are birds of the far north. So they're breeding high up in the Arctic tundra of Alaska and, and northern Canada. This is a Pacific loon, much smaller than either the yellow-billed or the common loons, less than half the size, more widespread than the, than the uh, yellow-billed loon, but again, a bird of the tundra and the taiga regions of Alaska and Northern Canada. And this is the Arctic loon. Uh, if you're thinking that it looks very similar to that Pacific loon that I just showed you, that's because they are actually very closely related so closely related that up until 1985, we considered those two species, the, uh, the Pacific and the Arctic loon, one and the same species. It's only based on very subtle differences in the plumage and actually looking at the genes of these two birds that we separated them out into their two separate species. So this is typically and generally a Eurasian bird, but we have found some um, breeding Arctic loons up in the extreme northern uh, tip. This is the red-throated loon. This is the smallest and the least loon-like of all of our loons. It's the only loon that can take off directly from land without this long running start across the surface of the water uh, that any of you have seen, who have seen a common loon take off from the water, you'll be very familiar with that. Um, the red-throated loon, also another far northern species, but this is the only other species of loon that you're likely to see in New Hampshire because they overwinter off of the Atlantic coast, including off the coast of New Hampshire. And every year we, we have scattered reports of these red-throated loons on some of New Hampshire's lakes as they migrate back and forth between the breeding grounds and the overwintering grounds. 
So this is not a loon. This is a duck, a, a male common merganser to be exact. Uh, so every year we get reports from folks of, about a loon and, you know, eight or 10 little chicks trailing behind it. And, and we have to tell those folks, you know, that's a great wildlife sighting, but it's not a loon that you're seeing because loons are only going to have one or two chicks. Um, and sometimes we've actually had people, you know, get really irate and say, now look, I've lived in New Hampshire all my life. I know a loon when I see a loon. And that was a loon with, you know, eight or nine chicks behind it. And so we thank them for those reports and we quietly vertical file those and we don't, we, uh, you know, don't refer back to those uh, again. But I can see how there could be a mistaken identity because like loons, this is a diving, fish eating, black and white bird. But there are several differences as well. And so one of which is that these birds are far smaller than loons, less than half the size of a loon. They sit much higher out of the water, so they're showing a lot more white along the sides. They don't have that checkerboard pattern along the back that is characteristic of an adult loon. And then there's that bill, which is bright red um, and not gray or, or black as a loon's bill is. And so uh, in addition to those you know, very obvious differences, there are other differences about the musculature and the skeleton, all of which render ducks very distinct from loons. And in fact, the fastest way to really annoy a loon researcher is to refer to them as ducks or waterfowl, because they are neither of those. So if loons are not ducks, you might ask, where do loons fit in with other living birds? And here is one close relative, a reasonably close relative to loons, and these are the penguins. So this is an emperor penguin. Some people, you know, say, well, you know, the color scheme seems to be about the same. They have that formal kind of black and, and white coloration. But obviously, there are several distinct differences as well. And chief among those is the fact that penguins are flightless. So those uh, flippers, you know, those wings that have been modified to such an extent, they're, no, they're pretty useless now for moving penguins through the air, but they're great at moving them through the water. So penguins are essentially flying underwater with those highly modified wings. Now, even that is very different than a loon, which uses its big webbed feet and not its wings to fly, to move around underwater. Um, but the topper for me, in terms of these differences, is that penguins are a bird only of the southern hemisphere, whereas loons are found only north of the equator. So we probably have to go way back in time to find a common ancestor for these two groups of birds. And the story gets even stranger because the other group of birds that are closely related are the tube-nosed swimmers. And so those are the albatrosses, the petrels, and the shearwaters. So here is a wandering albatross, um, and this is a graceful, soaring bird that spends most of its life in the air, you know, working those ocean air currents. Um, and, and I'm trying to tell you good folks, that this is actually pretty closely related to our stubby winged little loons that can barely take off, you know, from the surface of the, of the water. Um, but here again, genes don't lie. And there's actually a couple of geneticists way back in 1983, I think that now that uh, Sibley and Alquist, and they did this genetic assay of the entire the groups of all groups of birds. And what they found is that these three groups, the loons, the penguins, the tube-nosed swimmers, grouped out fairly close to each other, and they were fairly distinct from all the other lineages and groups of, of birds. Um, and the other thing, you know, that makes us feel a little bit better about this unlikely grouping is the lifestyle characteristic, and that is the ocean. So um, all of these birds spend some time in the ocean. And in fact, most of us think of loons as freshwater birds that go to overwinter in the ocean, it's actually just as correct, and maybe it's more correct to think of loons as an ocean bird that comes to freshwater only to breed. So I'll talk a little bit more about the lifestyle of loons. So loons are diving, fish-eating birds. And there, there's another fish-eating bird that we're all very familiar with if you've spent any time on the lake, which is the great blue heron. But herons and loons go about that business of catching their fish in very different ways. And so a heron does its best to just imitate a tree. And it's an ambush predator, classic ambush predator. Um, and it just waits for a fish or a crayfish to walk by and then it snatches uh, that, that piece of, of meal up. Um, but loons, uh, in contrast, are very active predators. So they will actually peer beneath the surface of the lake and they're looking for a fish or a school of fish swimming around down there. And when they see that, they will dive and they will give chase. And sometimes people ask me what the favorite food of a loon is. And it turns out loons have very few taste buds. So there's no evidence that we have that they're selecting one fish or, or another based on the kind of taste preference. 
um, it's typically really the fish itself that determines whether or not it's going to be caught. Because if a loon is chasing a trout or landlocked salmon, any of our cold water species that we always think of as, as good eating, um, those fish, if they're being chased by a loon, are going to put on a burst of speed and they go straight down into the cold, deep part of the lake. And that's where loons can't easily follow them. Loons are fast, but they're not as fast as a trout uh, or a landlocked salmon. So it's hard for them to catch those fish. But our warm water species, in contrast, and, and here I mean, you know, a yellow perch or a, um, a sunfish, maybe a small, smallmouth bass, if they're being chased by a loon or any other predator, their method of trying to escape is to zigzag like crazy at the surface of the water. Now, loons are so maneuverable that every time that fish zigs or zags, a loon can cut the corner until it's close enough to reach out and grab it. Most of those fish are swallowed underwater, so we don't get a good chance to see what it is that these loons are, are eating, but this loon is probably on its way to feed this fish to one of its chicks. So a couple of adaptations uh, that I'd like to talk about that make loons these exceptional divers and, and swimmers. And so one of these is pretty obvious from this picture, and that is that the legs of loon are placed far back, right at the very, very back of the body all wrong for walking, but it makes some incredibly efficient swimmers and loons can move through the water almost like a torpedo. The other adaptation that you can't see from this picture is that the bones of loons are very dense. And some people, and I've even read in some books, and they'll say, oh, well, loon bones are solid. Actually not true. They're not all solid, but they are very much more dense. They have thicker walls and less air in them than the bones of virtually any other flighted bird. And when you think about it, if, if you ever try to dive beneath the surface of the water, wearing water wings or any kind of flotation that works by trapping bubbles of air, you know that's not a great strategy if you want to spend any amount of time under the surface. And so these dense bones help loons achieve kind of a neutral buoyancy and allows them to, to stay underwater for a long period of, of time efficiently. Here's another shot of a, of a swimming loon underwater. And I show this just to show you that the wings of the, these birds are held tight right up against the body when they're swimming underwater. So those wings are not really used for swimming and they're actually a little bit of a detriment. They just create a little bit of extra drag when that loon is underwater um, doing its thing, trying to catch its fish. And so for that reason, the wings of loons are very small. And that combination of small wings and a heavy body means that loons have one of the highest wing loadings of any flying bird. And so wing loading, that essentially refers to, the, to every square inch of a loon's wing and how much body weight that square inch has to hold aloft when it's flying. The so loons actually have the second highest wing loading of any flying bird in North America. They're second only to the swan. And that means you'll often see this, a long running start to build up enough airspeed to, uh, to get enough air over those stubby little wings to lift that heavy body off the surface of the water. On a dead calm day, they can take loons up to a quarter of a mile to get air. So here's another shot of a loon. This one is almost uh, pretty much achieved takeoff at this time. And sometimes, especially on a small lake, you may see loon take off from the surface of the water and then do a couple of circuits around the lake before it ends up flying off in one direction or another. And that's not a scenic tour on the part of that bird. Every circuit of the lake helps it gain a few precious feet of altitude until it can clear the trees at the water's edge. Now, once these birds are in the air, their flight is swift and direct, and a flying loon will beat its wings about four times a second, and that's enough to help it uh, reach uh, a speed and level flight of up to 80 miles an hour. There's actually a couple of pieces of hunter folklore around the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, I guess. One was that if a loon was happily and calmly floating on the surface of the lake, and if a hunter shot at it, the loon could see the flash from that hunter's from rifle and slip beneath the waves before that bullet reached it. The other is that a flying loon, if it was flying away from you, you could shoot at that loon, but the shot would never overtake the loon. And I think a few loons lost their lives testing those theories, but we don't do that anymore. So those legs at the back of the body mean that loons are almost helpless on land. So they can balance for a short period of time when they're building a nest or if they're turning eggs in the, in the nest, uh, but, but really essentially almost helpless on, on land. And that's why a loon's nest is always built right next to the water. 
So those nests can be pretty elaborate structures like this one made up of piled mud and vegetation. Or they can just be a shallow scrape in the sand like this one is, and they can be right out in the open. Or they can be quite well hidden. So most of us don't think of that black and white speckling on a loon's back as camouflage, but if they're nesting under vegetation that, that lets only dappled sunlight reach the ground, it actually works pretty well to break up the outline of that bird. So two eggs are typically laid in that nest. Those are olive colored with spots that helps them to camouflage uh, themselves against that nest material. And that's important because at the very beginning of incubation, loons can sometimes leave those eggs uncovered for an hour or, or more. A little bit larger than a chicken egg. They probably make a heck of an omelet, but of course we do not do that at the Loon Preservation Committee. Both parents share in all aspects of chick rearing. That includes making the nest, to incubating the eggs, to feeding and caring for the chicks. So um, when adults do a nest exchange, they use that opportunity to roll the eggs. That uh, allows good gases, good oxygen in, it flushes bad gases out, and it keeps the embryo from sticking to one side of the egg. And if all goes well, after 27 or 28 days, we have the first of our loon chicks. If two eggs were laid, the second chick will typically hatch within 24 or 36 hours of the first egg. Chicks are going to stay on that nest until they're dry, sometimes overnight, and then they take to the water. So here's a, a couple of newborn chicks in their first coat of dark down, probably only a couple of days old in this picture. So you can see this chick is not gonna be flying anytime soon. Those little wing buds are not developed at all, but those legs and feet are ready for action. And these chicks can swim as soon as they are hatched. And despite that, you're often, you'll often see this, a couple of chicks riding on the back of one of their parents. And so we think that there are a couple of reasons why loons do this. And one is that cold water can suck heat out of a tiny body very quickly. So this helps these chicks to thermoregulate, to maintain a, a stable and constant body temperature. And the other is that an awful lot of things will eat loon chicks if they can get them. So that includes a large fish or a snapping turtle, uh, but it also includes an eagle flying overhead. So overall, it's probably the safest place for these chicks to be is riding up on the back of their parents. The chicks grow very rapidly. So after two weeks, these chicks have lost their first coat of that very dark down and they've molted into a second downy plumage, which is kind of a light brown uh, gray color. And at seven weeks, that second coat of down is molting and now they're just beginning to, to show some juvenile feathers along the back there. These are the feathers that give shape and contour to the body. They allow for longer dives. Eventually they allow for flight. And at 10 weeks, you know, we have a bird that looks recognizably like our majestic loons, at least in, in profile. Um, this is, you know, a juvenile plumage, and this loon is going to look essentially exactly the same as this for about the next two years. It's about 26 months of age before loons first molt into that black and white plumage, which we actually call the alternate or the breeding plumage. So at 10 weeks of flight feathers, as you can see, they've grown in, but those flight muscles are still developing. And you'll see them making these rushes across the water um, to begin to, to work up the muscle mass that they're gonna need to fly. At this point, the chicks are very able to catch their own food, but it's still easier to beg from your parents for a little while longer if you can. And then by 12 or 13 weeks, you know, these birds are flying. And at that point, they'll begin to explore their, their larger natural world. They begin to fly around a little bit. Um, but at the end of the day, they'll always come back to that natal lake for that first summer. That's where their parents are and they know where the good fishing is as well. So they feel safe and secure on that lake or, or on that territory within the lake. So by fall, the chicks are almost fully grown. Uh, the adults by this time are molting out of that alternate or breeding plumage into what we call the basic or the overwintering plumage, which is that kind of gray color. It looks very much like a juvenile loon, and it can actually even be hard to tell them apart at this point. So the needs of loons are pretty simple when you think about it. Loons are, again, diving fish-eating birds, and so they need clear, 
uh, clean water to catch the fish that they need to eat, and they need quiet places to incubate their eggs and to raise their young. And it's when one or more of those things are missing that loons run into trouble. So the large lakes that loons claim as breeding territories are also, unfortunately, the endpoints for many of our toxins. And one toxin that LPC has had its eyes on for quite a while now is mercury. Turns out that loons in the Northeast have the highest levels of mercury found in any loons in the United States. And that's as measured in, in unhatched eggs taken from failed loon nests, and those are the green bars, and also the blood of live captured loons, and those are the yellow and the gold bars in this graph. So where does this mercury come from? So mercury is a naturally occurring element, and that means that it's present in very minute quantities just about everywhere. That means that mercury is also present in coal, but the mercury that is present in that coal is bound up in that coal safely beneath the surface of the earth where it can't do much harm to living things until we mine that coal and bring it to the surface and burn it to create electricity. So mercury being an element is difficult to destroy. It survives that combustion process. It goes up the smokestack and then it comes right back down into our lakes and ponds. Mercury is also the only metal that is a liquid at room temperature. And so it has these unique properties that have made it useful in things like old thermometers and uh, compact fluorescent light bulbs and electrical switches. And so when these consumer goods have outlived their useful purposes, if we dispose of them incorrectly by simply throwing them into the garbage, they end up at a landfill or even worse in an incinerator and again up the smokestack and then right back down. And so the areas in New Hampshire where we have found the highest levels of mercury in these failed loon eggs, as well as the blood of live captured loons, and these are the, the orange and the red areas on that map, these are all downwind of coal-fired power plants or municipal waste and sewers. And that's important because mercury is a potent neurotoxin. As little as 1.3 parts per million of mercury can kill an embryo developing inside of a loon egg. And we've pulled eggs off of some lakes in New Hampshire that meet or even exceed those levels. So it's definitely an issue for our birds here. Shoreline development and the things that go with shoreline development uh, are also a, a problem for loons. Um, we, uh, you know, loons love to nest on islands. We humans also love to nest on islands or otherwise change shorelines. And when we do that, we can displace these loons from their traditional and historical nest. And since loons nest by the water, they can get into trouble if we move the water. So drawdowns for flood control and power production um, can strand these nests out of reach of loons. If we have a, a happily nesting loon right at the water's edge and drop the level of that lake by a couple of feet, that can expose 10 or 12 feet of muddy, rocky lake bottom. And sometimes it's just too far for a loon to go to get back to its nest. And you know, the opposite can happen as well. Water level rises from a storm event or even, even the wake from large boats going too close to a loon nest at too great a speed. Um, those can swamp a loon nest and even wash out loon eggs. And the close approach of boats can flush incubating loons off of a nest. Um, if you happen to flush a loon off the nest, if you leave that area right away, the chances are pretty good that that loon is gonna hop back on after a period of time. Now the danger is that if it's a really hot day and sunny, those eggs can cook on the nest. If it's a cold and, um, and wet day, they can chill. Either one of those can kill the embryo developing inside of that egg. Um, and that exposed nest also leaves those eggs exposed to any predators or any scavengers that are working their way along the shoreline or flying overhead and looking for an easy nest. And there are plenty of those predators around. So a lot of animals will take a loon egg if they can get it. That includes raccoons and mink. Those are probably the two biggest culprits um, here in New Hampshire. But it also includes foxes or skunks or bears or possums um, or, or uh, um, coyotes, you know, any number of, of loons, anything that is working its way along the shoreline and sees an untended loon nest or, or will flush a loon off the nest is gonna take that opportunity to grab that egg. And crows and gulls and eagles will also take loon eggs. Eagles will also take loon chicks. And there are even um, more and more now we're getting reports of, of eagles taking adult loons. 
And in the past, most of those reports came from the Midwest where their loons are a little bit smaller, only about a half to two thirds the size of our big loons here in the Northeast. But as eagle populations have been increasing at a much greater rate than our loon population, we're beginning to see more and more incidences as well of eagles predating adult loons. So once a loon chick is hatched though, to get back to these chicks, they're not out of danger uh, because these chicks are small and they're dark and they're too buoyant in that downy plumage to dive away from approaching boats. And so collisions with power boats and jet skis are still the number one human related cause of loon chick murder. And uh, too many boats too close to loons for too long can also just impede the care and the feeding of young. So, you know, it's a full-time job for two loons to raise two chicks over the course of the summer. And the problem is that as soon as these little loon chicks hatch, they act as magnets for people. So we all want to share in a little, in, in the intimate moment of a loon family. And sometimes we want to get just a little bit closer to, you know, to get that better view. And the problem is if we get too close to these loons, they stop doing what they're doing, which is what they need to be doing, which is, and also the reason why we wanted to watch them in the first place. And they begin to focus their attention on us as potential predators coming too close to their chicks and that loon family. Um, and so, you know, we, so, and then of course, you know, one of the things that they might do is just turn around and swim away to put a little bit more space between us. And then what do some of us do? Well, we've had a little bit harder, right? To get back and close up to these loons. So I've actually seen loon families being pursued in slow motion, you know, by canoers and kayakers just doing little circuits of the lake. And those loons are not caring for their, those chicks. They're not feeding those chicks. And that can mean that those chicks actually can die of starvation because they're not being tended. So, um, you know, I always say, if you wanna get close to a pair of loons on a lake, there's only one way to do that. And that is with a good pair of binoculars. If you wanna take a beautiful photo of a loon's family, there's only one way to do that. And that's with a good telephoto lens and a nice camera. Every once in a while, we have somebody come into the loon center and they say, oh, you, the loons were dancing for us. And I'm always surprised that uh, people don't recognize that this is a sign of an animal in great distress. So this, this bird is doing a distraction display to distract the attention again of us, which uh, it, it's viewing as a potential predator away from its nest or its chicks or its mate. And these birds really need to be spending their time and energy doing things other than these distraction displays. So the photographer who took this picture was way too close to this bird. Loons and other wildlife can become entangled in discarded monofilament line. Uh, because loons have no opposable thumbs, if they find themselves wrapped in that line, they will try and remove that line with their bill. And we've actually encountered, you know, some loons that have their bills entirely wired shut, you know, with, with fishing line wrapped around it. And if we can't rescue those birds, they can actually die from a combination of starvation and exposure. So, you know, a lot of challenges um, facing uh, loons, none larger than this one lead um, headed, you know, uh, or lead headed fishing jigs, which is just a sinker that has the hook molded right into it. And that's this picture um, or lead uh, sinkers. Th these are a huge problem for our loons. And so loons can ingest, it seems like an odd thing. Why would a loon ingest lead tackle? And it can happen, we think in one of three ways. And so, um, so loons have no teeth. Uh, and so they will actually forage along the lake bottom and they're looking for these little pebbles and they swallow those little pebbles and they ingest those and they hold those pebbles in the gizzard, the muscular portion of their, of their stomach. And they use those as surrogate teeth to grind up the fish that they have just eaten. And that's worked well for loons over their long, long history until the last couple of hundred years where we've, in, um, we've been adding little things to their environment that are about the same size and shape as these little pebbles that they're looking for. And those things are small, these small, lead split shot sinkers. So, and we used to think that that was actually the, the largest or the, the primary cause of lead poisoning in these birds. But now we actually think that most lead fatalities happen in another way, in two other ways, actually. One is that the, um, you know, a, a, um, a typical prey item for a limb is probably a six inch yellow perch. But on occasion, 
loons can go after and catch and ingest larger fish. And when you're beginning to talk about a fish that's larger than that six or eight inch yellow perch, you're starting to talk about a fish that could break an angler's line. And so when that line breaks, that fish is still gonna be trailing, you know, a, a sinker or a lead-headed jig or, um, or a hook or, or a length of line. And so that fish is gonna be a little bit slower than the fish next to it. It's gonna be swimming a little bit erratically and that's the fish a loon is gonna zero in on as an easy meal. And when it ingests the fish, of course, it ingests that sinker or, or lead-headed jig as well. And then finally, if you're fishing, you know, you're trying to catch a fish, but you could catch a loon instead because a loon's instinct is to strike at something if it flashes by it in the water. So once ingested, that lead gets abraded because it's rubbing against the stones that are already in that stomach and it's being subjected to those stomach acids and that lead erodes and goes throughout the, the bloodstream and into the body tissues and it causes lead poisoning. So the good news here is if you are fishing with anything other than lead, and there are a lot of things that we use now for lead tackle, right? So, which are, which are safe and non-poisonous. So there's steel, tin, bismuth, stone, rubber. A loon can swallow any one of these and likely it will be just fine. But the smallest little split shot sinker that you can imagine, if it's made out of lead, and if a loon swallows that, that lead split shot, that will kill that bird within two to four weeks. So we're not asking folks to stop fishing but we are asking you to go through those old tackle boxes and remove that lead tackle and treat yourself and treat loons to some new non-toxic loon safe tackle. And we have gotten, I mean, it's the worst part of our jobs to, to pick up a loon that is obviously dying for some cause to take it to a veterinarian. And we have several wonderful veterinarians that we work with throughout the state. And to see that radiograph, that x-ray and that bright object in there, which means that that's you know, a, 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 there's a metal object in there to take a blood sample and find that the lead levels are off the charts. And we know at that point that that loon is going to die. And the only thing that we can do for that, if it's not dead already, is subject it to the euthanasia. So it's the very worst part of our job. And we're so tired of doing this that we are now paying people. We will pay you to, to, to get rid of your lead tackle. For details on that, go to loon.org or go to our loonsafe.org website and learn about our lead tackle buyback program. Yes, we will buy back your lead tackle to keep it from poisoning loons or other wildlife here in Maine. So back in 1975, people began to notice that loons were becoming less calm on New Hampshire's lake. And the thinking at that time was that if human activities had contributed to those declines, and it seemed pretty likely that they had, then human activities, if they were coordinated, and thoughtful could reverse those declines once again. And that is the hope and the philosophy on which the Loon Preservation Committee was created. Um, and this is the point where I'm gonna turn it over to Caroline, our volunteer and outreach um, coordinator or biologist um, to talk a little bit more about LPC's work in support of loons. Okay, can you hear me? Can hear you. Okay, great. And um, can you see my slides at this point? There we go. That's got it. You got them? Yeah. Okay, good. So um, Harry already covered what is, um, you know, mentioned in this slide, but essentially all of those threats that loons are facing, um, it's our job at LPC to help them cope with those and to help them thrive in New Hampshire. Um, so a lot of work goes into that, and I'm going to talk about some of the things that we are doing every year to help New Hampshire's loon population. Uh, so the first thing is monitoring. Monitoring is really our bread and butter at LPC. It's how, you know, we first discovered that there was a problem with our loon population. It's how we, uh, you know, assess how our management strategies are doing at bringing back our loon population. Uh, and so this is a map of New Hampshire divided into our five geographic monitoring regions. So every summer from late May through early August, we have um, a biologist in each of these re regions whose job is to go out and count loons. Um, each biologist ends up being responsible for somewhere between 60 and 80 lakes, which they have to survey multiple times over the course of the season. Um, and that includes both lakes that have a known history of loon activity, as well as lakes that don't have loons yet, but have habitat suitable 
uh, for loons. So they have the potential to host loons in the future. And we survey the, those so that as our population grows and loons start to colonize new lakes, um, we can detect that and you know, include them in our loon count. And then in addition to these five monitoring regions, we have a biologist for each of New Hampshire's three largest lakes. Uh, so Winnipesaukee gets its own biologist, Squam gets its own biologist, and Lake Umbago gets its own biologist as well. Um, and again, we're going out there to count loons. So, uh, you know, we're counting how many loons there are in total, but also how many of those loons form pairs, how many of those pairs actually nest in a given year, uh, of those nests, how many chicks hatch, and how many of those chicks that hatch survive to the end of the season. And so all of those metrics help us to determine how our loon population is doing. In addition to that, we collect a lot of information about specific nests and nest attempts. So for every nest attempt, we're collecting data on the timing. When did it start? When did it finish? Um, we're collecting nest site specific characteristics like uh, whether the loons build up a nice nest bowl or if they just you know, use one of the scrape nests like Harry showed earlier. Uh, we're looking at how much overhead cover they have in terms of vegetation, how much lateral cover they have. And then we're also looking at the nest outcome. So did they hatch or did they fail? And if they fail, we put on our detective caps and we scour the area around that nest and we try to find clues to figure out why this nest failed. So we're looking for things like eggshells either in the nest bowl or you know, in the area surrounding the nest bowl, um, which would indicate predation. We're looking for eggs that might be floating in the water around the nest. And whatever we find, we collect, we document it. Um, and we just try to really assign a nest failure cause to any nest that fails. And all of that helps to inform our management. Um, so the picture here shows a loon nest draft, which is one of the management strategies that we employ. In New Hampshire, LPC staff and volunteers float anywhere between 80 and 90 of these rafts in a given year. Um, in this past year, we floated 85. Uh, these rafts help loons cope with a lot of the threats that they face when they're nesting. So uh, they rise and they fall with water levels so that if there's a lake where, you know, our monitoring has indicated that the nest has failed several years in a row because it got flooded, then we'll put out one of these rafts to try to help loons cope with those changing water levels. They also provide nesting habitat on lakes uh, that have been so developed that there's not any good quality nest, natural habitat left. Um, they have an overhead cover, which helps protect them from avian predators. And then we usually anchor them 15 to 20 feet out from the shoreline, um, which doesn't necessarily mean that a mammal is not going to swim out and try to predate those eggs, but it makes it less likely. It makes it a little harder for that mammal to get to the nest. In addition to the rafts, we also will float loon nesting signs uh, at sites that have really high boat traffic or at sites where the loons have nested in a really exposed spot and are attracting a lot of attention. And the point of these signs is to, you know, remind people that nesting loons need their space. Uh, as Harry said earlier, you know, loons on the nest, when they're on land, they're very, very vulnerable. And so if people approach them really closely, they perceive that as a threat, they get into the water, um, you know, to try to remain safe and they leave their eggs exposed and vulnerable. So these signs are designed to, you know, keep people away from the nest and allow the loons to focus on their job, which is incubating those eggs consistently. Um, at sites where uh, there's particularly high human pressure or where human encroachment has been found to cause nests to fail in the past, we might also put out rope lines. And the goal of these rope lines is to reinforce the message of the sign. Um, they provide a physical barrier between boats and the nest so that people have a visual idea of exactly how far they should be staying away from that nest. We do loon rescues. So Harry mentioned, you know, that loons will get tangled, um, you know, and loons might beach themselves for other issues like lead. Um, LPC this year did over 30 loon rescues, most in the summer, but we did a couple in the winter as well for loons that became iced in. Um, and so when we go out to do a loon rescue, if we're successful in capturing the loon, the first thing that we do is uh, deal with any immediate issues. So if it's tangled, we untangle it. But after that, we you know, start assessing its condition. So we'll take a blood sample, test it for lead. We'll take it to a veterinarian and get a radiograph to see if it has any embedded hooks that might become infected, um, or if it has aspergillosis, which is a fungal respiratory disease that can be detected on a radiograph. 
And the goal with these rescues is really to get the loons back out into the wild as soon as we possibly can, if we can. Um, loons are a species that is notoriously difficult to keep in captivity. They just, they decline really rapidly. And so if we can minimize the amount of time that they're being handled by humans and the amount of time that they're in an environment that is not natural, then we want to do that. Um, in some cases, we do detect underlying problems that mean that that loon will need to undergo some rehabilitation. And in those cases, we work with some great rehabbers, uh, both in New Hampshire and in Maine. Um, so Maria Colby at Wings of the Dawn. We also work with uh, Diane Wynn at Avian Haven, and we work with Cappy Springer uh, in Maine. And it, you know, it really takes a village to do a successful loon rescue. So we're depending on the people who are out there on the lakes, keeping their eye out and reporting loons in distress to us. And we're also depending on rehabbers and uh, the veterinarians who are so often donating their time and their skills and expertise free of charge. We do a lot of public education and outreach as well. Um, so in a non-COVID year, we would typically be going and doing these presentations in person. Uh, we do anywhere between 120 and 130 of them in a given year um, for lake associations or at public libraries or for rotary clubs or other groups that are interested. Um, and these presentations are designed to teach people about loons, to teach them about the threats they, they face and to teach them about how we as humans using lakes can modify our behavior to help loons. In recent years, our live loon cam has been a great educational tool. Uh, so we started live streaming this in 2014. And in 2016, we switched to broadcasting it via YouTube. Um, and that made a huge difference in terms of viewership. We've had hundreds of thousands of viewers from all 50 states and over 180 countries. Um, and we realized that this is a really great tool for reaching a lot of people um, and teaching them about loons, getting them invested in loons and getting them to care about protecting loons. Um, so people who watch the loon cam get a really intimate view of the entire nesting process. They get to watch as the loons select their nest site, build their nest, lay their eggs, incubate for 27 days. Um, and in that time period, we get to see some really cool things like a heron landing on the nest, mm -hmm. Or, you know, we frequently see turtles climbing up on the nest and getting chased off by the loons. And then of course we get a really, really intimate view of the hatching process. Um, and so this is one of the really cool things about the loon cam, because even if you lived in a house, you know, directly in front of the nest site and you were watching through your binoculars as the hatch happened, you probably wouldn't get views like this. Um, and so again, it's just been a really great way to get people invested in this species and to get people interested in protecting them. A lot of our work has been dedicated to reducing loon mortality from lead. As Harry mentioned, lead is the leading cause of adult loon mortality in New Hampshire. Um, since 1989, it has been responsible for 42% of adult loon deaths that we've documented. So it's a big problem uh, and it's one that we've been trying to solve. So in 2013, LPC's uh, data and testimony helped get a law passed in New Hampshire that banned the sale and the freshwater use of lead sinkers and lead headed jigs that weigh one ounce or less. That's the size range that is known to uh, most frequently kill loons. And so now that that law has passed and it went into effect in 2016, our focus has really been on education. Um, partially because people who, you know, bought their tackle before the ban went into effect might still have it and might not be aware that it's illegal to use now. Um, and also because New Hampshire has the strictest law regarding lead. And so if people are coming to our state from other states to vacation and they're bringing their tackle with them, they might not realize that it's illegal to use lead tackle here and that lead tackle has such a negative impact on our wildlife. So, um, We've been focusing on education and we've been focusing on incentivizing people to start using more loon safe tackle. Uh, so as part of our buyback program, we partner with Fish and Game and with eight uh, retail shops within New Hampshire. And at any of those shops, people can go and turn in one ounce or more of illegally sized lead fishing tackle. And in return, they get a $10 voucher that they can use to buy replacement tackle. Uh, so if, as you're listening to this, you realize that you have lead tackle in your tackle box uh, or you have friends or family that might, please do go to loonsafe.org to find our list of participating retailers and turn that in. 
Um, and then we also do lots of different research projects on loons. Uh, so one thing that we do is banding and tracking loons. Uh, in any given summer, we will be capturing and banding between 20 and 40 loons. Um, when we band them, we give them a unique combination of four bands. So each loon gets two bands per leg. One of those bands is always a silver Fish and Wildlife Service band that has an ID number. And then the remaining bands are plastic color bands. And we give them those bands in a unique combination so that, for example, only one loon uh, in New Hampshire will have a blue band over a yellow band on its left leg and a green band over a silver band on its right leg. And then if we see that combination in the future, we know exactly who that loon is and we can track its survival year to year. And we can also track how many chicks that it produces over its lifetime. Um, we recently did an informational series on the banded loons of New Hampshire. So within the state, we have about 200 banded loons. And during the month of November, uh, we did profiles on 30 of those loons uh, where we you know, provided pictures of them and their bands and talked about their life history. So if you're interested in seeing that, you can go to loon.org slash banded dash loons. Uh, for every loon that dies in New Hampshire and is reported to us, we go out and we collect it and we take it to get a necropsy to figure out what killed that loon. That's been really important because that's how we determined that lead was such a big problem for loons. And so we continue to collect loons and get them necropsied so that we can keep an eye on emerging threats to loon survival. We're also looking at the impacts of climate change on loon reproduction. Um, so loons are a Northern species and here in New Hampshire, we're towards the Southern edge of their breeding limits. Um, so we're already in sort of the warmer area for loons. And unfortunately, the climate change predictions indicate that it's gonna get warmer here. We're gonna get more precipitation. Uh, and those are both things that LPC's data has suggested are negative uh, for loon reproduction. And so in addition to looking at how those things impact uh, loon reproduction, we've also been looking at ways that we can modify our management strategies to help loons cope with those oncoming threats. We're looking into the impacts of contaminants on loon reproduction, and we're gonna have a whole talk on that uh, in April. So if you're interested in learning more about that, please do uh, attend that talk. In collaboration with Jim Haney's lab at UNH, we're looking into cyanotoxins. So every time that we band a loon, we take a blood sample and we send some of that blood to Jim over at UNH so that he and his research team can look at it and look at the levels of cyanotoxins as part of their ongoing research into cyanobacteria uh, and cyanoblooms in New Hampshire. We're looking at the impacts of lead on loon survival and population growth rates. That's going to be our presentation for next month. Um, and similarly to looking at the causes of loon mortality, we're also looking at causes of nest failure. Again, so that we can you know, detect any emerging threats and try to find management strategies to address those threats. And so all of that work that I just described forms our loon recovery plan. And this is a graph that shows the loon population in New Hampshire from the time that LPC started uh, to present. And so in that time, our loon population has more than tripled, which is very exciting and you know, shows that our work is working. Um, but every single loon that's been added to our population has been really hard fought. It's taken a lot of work to get to where we are. Um, and you know, with the new threats that are emerging to loons like climate change, we know that there's a lot of work still left to do. Um, and we're eager to take on that work. And so that is the end of the presentation. So we can have some time for questions now. I'm going to exit out and stop screen sharing so that I can go over and check out the YouTube comments section. Um, so if anyone has questions now, please do feel free to put them in the chat on YouTube. Uh, and Harry and I will be here to answer for the next 10 to 15 minutes. It looks like we don't have any questions yet. So uh, maybe we, <laughs> we did our job. <laughs> we, we, I can't believe that we've answered everything that folks want to know about Liz. No, no question is too small. People should be free to ask. Right. Um, we can't guarantee we'll have an answer, but we'll try. <laughs> yeah, well, so I guess we should also say at this time um, that LPC is a membership supported organization. And so uh, if you think that the work that we just talked about is important and worth doing, 
please do consider becoming a member um, and you can do that at loon.org. Yeah, all right. It looks like we still don't have any questions in the chat. So um, all right. with that said, I guess, uh, I guess we can end the presentation. That, that sounds good, Caroline, I'm, I'm, and I'm uh, surprised, but maybe we did, you know, cover cover everything. Um, thank you for that uh, pitch for uh, membership, and, and just to re reiterate, yes, LPC is a, is a membership organization, and to all of our members out there who might be watching today, thank you um, for your support, and it, that is what has allowed us to do this great work, um, and your continued support will allow us to continue on that work into the future. So our, our goal here is to you know, recover a healthy and viable loon population in New Hampshire. Um, you know, we know that we have, we have not um, yet recovered that population to historical levels, but we are well on that path despite the increasing challenges that, uh, that loons are facing. So once again, thank you for your support and, uh, and thank you for your continued support in the future as we try and finish this job. Uh, and Harry, now the questions are pouring in. So oh, they are. My um, goodness. All right. Well, I was too I was too quick on the drop, but but all right. Let's try and answer some questions. Yeah. So the first question we have is: um, Is there a Michigan chapter to our agency, or is there someone doing work for loons in Michigan? Yeah. So absolutely. So the, there is a there's a Michigan Loon Protective Association. I think MLPA. You should Google them. Uh, they do good work. Um, and and um, I know. This because um, formerly we were all part of kind of an umbrella organization called the North American Loon Fund. And so the, the Michigan uh, chapter had that. Um, we, there are other organizations, you know, in, in Vermont and upstate New York, in Maine, doing the same good work that the Loon Preservation Committee is doing in their respective states. So if you're, if you're coming to us from uh, one of those other states, then I encourage you to look up and, uh, and support, you know, that or those organizations as well. Um, and then there's a question about banding. So it says, how are the loons caught for banding? Um, do you want to take that one or do you want me no, to? I will let you take that one, Caroline. All right. Yeah. So we go out banding um, late at night after dark. Um, we target loons that have chicks. Um, we go out with the spotlight and we shine that light around until we find the loons. Once we find the loons, we keep that light shined on them and we approach in our boat. Um, and those loons, because they have chicks, they're going to stay above the water to try to defend their chicks. And so usually they um, will let us come right up to them and we just scoop them up in a net. Um, we'll also scoop up the chicks in a separate net so that we can keep them safe and with the adults. Um, and then when we're done banding, we just put them back in the water. We put the chicks back with them and we get the heck out of there so that they can, uh, you know, get regroup with their partner and with their family. Um, yeah, so the answer is with a big spotlight and a giant net. <laughs> um, there's a question about Swains Lake. So are you familiar with Swains Lake and Swains Lake and how long have the loons been on Swains? Yes, we do monitor Swains Lake. I'm not totally sure off the top of my head exactly when the first loon pair got to Swains Lake. Uh, but the really cool thing about Swains is it's that it's one of the loon, the lakes in New Hampshire uh, that has recently, within the past five years, gained a second pair of loons. So it's big enough to support two pairs. And as our loon population has grown, a second pair has taken up residence within the last five years on Swains. Hmm. And um, is Swains, is that the one that's close to Mendham's Pond as well? Yep, yep, Swains yeah. is in Barrington. And Barrington is a town that has a lot of loon lakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's also one of the higher mercury um, level uh, lakes, or at least, you know, it was in the past. So it's a lake that's of particular interest to us for that reason. And, and uh, we're actually watching in, in many lakes, we're recording um, a decrease in the levels of mercury, you know, as, as we have gotten better at, at uh, keeping mercury out of our environment. And so we're seeing a return of some, uh, some biological health to, to many of these lakes. Um, here's a question. How long do loons nest? Their live stream cut out when uh, we mentioned that for the first time. Oh, yeah. So a typical, so and Caroline, as, as the person who is in charge of, of uh, LPC's webcam and those related things as, as well, you have, you have been watching a lot of uh, nesting loons. So I'll let you handle that one too. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so the typical nesting period is anywhere between 27 and 29 days. Um, in some rare cases, they go a little longer than that and still successfully hatch. But generally, if we get to, you know, 31, 32 days and that loon nest still has not hatched, we assume that those eggs are uh, inviable and being over incubated. Um, are chicks hatched with red eyes? Yeah. So, um, so no, the answer to that is that the chicks have these wonderful kind of chocolate brown, um, you know, eyes and, and they stay, essentially they stay that way um, until that first molt into that alternate or breeding plumage at about like 26 months of, of age. And that's when the eyes begin to just kind of like redden up. And so, um, so some people have, have um, there are many, there are many, there's a lot of speculation about why loons have red eyes. Um, one, one of those thoughts is that it's a secondary sex characteristic. So just like those black, just like that black and white plumage, when the black, when you see a loon in black and white plumage and you see that red eye, that's a signal to other loons that that loon is mature and it's in breeding, you know, condition. Uh, and so it may be as simple as, as that. There are some other theories as, as well that abound about why loon's eyes are, are red. And I don't think that we'll get into all of those, uh, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Um, is there an easy way to tell if tackle is made out of lead? Uh, yeah, so this is a great question. Um, I mean, there are a couple of different ways. One is that apparently, you know, if you can write, um, if you, if you um, take that piece of tackle and, and um, if you can write on a piece of paper with it, so, cause lead is such a soft metal that it will actually come off on, on paper when you do it. Some of these lead, some of this lead tackle though is painted as well. And, and you know, my thought is, the easiest way to tell if your tackle is, is lead is if you if you haven't opened up that tackle box in, in 10 or 15 years, chances are about 99 percent that it's going to be lead because lead, unfortunately, you know, um, there's there's a reason why we began to use lead for fishing tackles because it's it's dense and so it can sink a line, but it's also cheap and it's readily available and it has this low melting point. And so you don't have to put much energy or cost into creating that tackle. And the sad thing, the unfortunate thing is all of those things together made lead kind of a staple for tackle. And it, and it had been that way for like, you know, a hundred years uh, or so um, until we began to, to get things like tin and tungsten and things of that nature, as we began to realize in part, as we began to realize just how um, toxic lead is, you know, not only to loons, um, but even to uh, to people who are handling it, right? And so these folks who used to, you know, bite onto a, a lead, um, a split shot sinker to crimp it onto a line, turns out that was not, you know, all that great for you. And you can actually, apparently now there's a, you can a, a measurably, you can measure the actual increase in a blood, in your blood after handling, you know, a piece of, of lead tap. So you don't want this stuff in your tackle box. You don't want your kids uh, to be handling it. You certainly don't want it to be ingested by loons or other wildlife. So the rule of thumb is if you don't know what it is, it is almost certainly lead. Um, and unless it, you know, unless it's in a package that says non-lead or tungsten or tin or something like that. And if it's old tackle, again, almost certainly lead. And if you're not sure, please bring it in. We will take it, we will pay you for it and, uh, and, and, uh, and hopefully get you to buy some of that new loon safe non-toxic tackle. Um, the next question is how old is the oldest loon that you monitor? Oh boy. So yeah, so Caroline, and that would that would probably be our that um, our umbagog loon. Mm -hmm. um, and she is one of the oldest birds. I think she's the oldest bird in all of New England and one of the oldest on record. And and haven't we figured out that she's like 29 or 30 years old or something in that area because she was banded as an adult. Mm -hmm. um, which in means 1993. She probably, in 1993, which means she was probably at least four years old, um, because most of the birds that we ban are banned are loons that have chicks and loons. Even though they're molting, even though they're sexually mature and they're molting into that alternate breeding plumage at 26 months old, that the typical age of first breeding of, of loons is really probably four five, maybe six years old. We followed some loons that were 10 or 11 years old before they first bred successfully. And once they have those chicks, that's when we can get them. So if you take that, if you take that year and then you add, you know, at least four or five years, could be even longer, that's where we get to, you know, our, our bird. She's certainly one of the oldest birds. And as of last year, 
she she was back on Lake Mbagog, and I'm not sure if she had ticks or not. She was successful breeding, and her mate is also an extremely old bird, so they're they're a senior couple um, there. Yeah, so for the past couple of years, she's been present, but not part of a pair anymore. So she mm. hasn't produced chicks in at least the past two years uh, yeah. that I know off the top of my head. But she's still around. She's um, coming back. You know? So there's great. still a chance that right. she might breed again. Yeah. Um, do all five species of loons have red eyes? And at what point do the chicks have red eyes? Yeah, boy, oh boy. So, I mean, um, Oh, geez, isn't that a great question? I believe that they do. Let me see. Check my, and I mean, and I've, I've actually seen all five species of, of loons, but some of them I've only seen, I'm, I've only ever seen one um, yellow-billed loon and it, was in, and it was an immature. So um, as we look at this, it looks, I believe that they all do as they're, as they're mature. Now I can't tell you um, if other loons mature at the same rate as, as loons. So I'm not sure if a red-throated loon is also, you know, mature at 26, you know, months of age, like a, um, uh, like common loon for some of these birds, you know, they're so un not well understood still that we may not even know the answers to those questions. So, yeah. Um, the next question is where can you see information on loons in Maine lakes? Um, so Maine Audubon does the loon monitoring in Maine. They do it through the Loon Census, which is an annual event held every year on the third Saturday of July. Um, and I believe they do post that information online so that if you Google Maine Loon Census results, it should come up and you can uh, get a look at that data. Good, yes, and it's, it's Tracy Hart that's in charge of that program now. And I would encourage you, uh, anybody who's interested in Loons and, and Maine, give Tracy a call um, and, uh, and become a member of Maine Audubon and, and get involved in those surveys as, as well. Because Maine has a lot of lakes and a lot of Loons and relatively few people. So, um, so the numbers, you know, for Maine, I think we know a little bit less about how Loons are faring in Maine than we do in New Hampshire. And it's information that a lot of folks are really very much interested in. So I, I encourage folks to get involved if they're in Maine. Um, so this one says, you might address this in April, but is there any evidence of toxins or tackle being ingested during the winter? This is from someone who has participated in Earthwatch with Jim Baruch um, down in the Gulf. Yeah, fantastic. Yes, and this is a great question. And yes, we have recorded loons um, with tackle that was probably saltwater tackle. Um, one of the ways that you can tell saltwater tackle is, is that typically it's, it's larger tackle. Um, and so when you're, when you're into saltwater tackle, sometimes you're substantially beyond that one ounce limit, which is the size range that we typically are finding loons that, have, that are ingesting tackle here in, in fresh water. So there's probably some, um, uh, some protection for loons just, in, just because the tackle is so much larger that they may not be viewing that as an ingestible item. But having said that, I think the largest piece of tackle that we ever found in a, in a loon was something and in the order of like five ounces or maybe more. And that was a loon that had ingested that in salt water. It was a huge piece of tackle. So um, yeah, so it can happen. Yikes. Um, so this is a question about Sunset Lake in Alton. Um, they do have a pair there, but um, that pair tends to split their time between a couple of lakes. And so the question is, um, how can we get a nesting pair on the lake? Is there anything that can be done to sort of entice those loons to, to nest yeah. on Sunset Lake? So it's, so it's interesting that if you've got like a pair of loons or loons that are kind of splitting their time, because um, you know, the typical, what we think of as the, the uh, prime loon territory is probably a lake maybe between 100 and 300 acres. And in lakes of that size, typically a loon pair will come down and they will just claim that entire lake as their territory. They'll defend the entire lake. And those loons tend to be pretty successful. When you get past 300 acres, and this is, these are all rules of thumb, but if you get past 300 acres, often you'll get a second pair on that lake. Uh, and then you go from there. So on our largest lakes, Winnipesaukee, we had, you know, somewhere around 30, you know, 28 to 30 pairs, somewhere in that, in that range in the last few years, historically, probably 40 or 50 pairs, you know, on, on Lake Winnipesaukee. But these pairs will kind of carve up the lake and each of them will have a little bay, you know, or something as they, that they call their, their uh, breeding territory. 
But more recently, we've also found that some loons can actually stitch together a territory out of several smaller lakes. And not, neither one of those lakes would have been big enough on their own to house a loon pair. But by defending two or three lakes, they can actually have this little complex of, of lakes. And loons that are nesting on there, it's harder you know, to get enough fish to feed your chicks. It's harder to defend that area. It takes a little bit more energy and investment. Loons on those lakes typically don't do as well as a loon on a prime breeding area, but sometimes they can make it work. And so the question, and I'm not sure how big um, that lake is, but you know, if it's between 100 and 300 acres, you're probably uh, well suited to be able to get a pair on that lake if there's suitable breeding territory on that. And that could be marshes, it could be small islands that are uninhabited, uh, it could be you know, um, vacant pieces of, of natural shoreline. Um, as, as well, but all of those are factors that kind of go into it, size and, and just the availability of, of nesting habitat um, as well. And so, uh, so there's, you know, so there is hope. Um, it'd be, we'd be interested in talking with you about that lake and finding out more information um, about it and seeing, you know, what the likelihood is or if we could get something started on your lake. And the hope, of course, is that we have a continually expanding loon population um, that is that is recolonizing, you know, many of these lakes that unfortunately, with the contraction of the loon population have been empty, you know, for too long, you know, in some cases 40 or 50 years or, or even longer. Um, do loons come back to the same lake each spring? Yeah, Carolina, did you want to handle Yeah, that so in general, yes. Um, they usually will return to the same lake, especially if they've had success there in the past. Sometimes, um, and especially during that, you know, first bit of the breeding season or, you know, throughout the early part of the breeding season, uh, that loon might be challenged by another loon of the same sex. And if, you know, they get into a territorial fight and the other loon wins, then uh, your old loon will be kicked out. Um, and so that can happen really early, early April when the loons are first getting back. Um, so you, you know, in general, yes, it's the same loons, but if one gets evicted or if one dies over the winter, it'll be uh, replaced by a different loon. Yeah. And this is one of the values, right, of, of banding loons as, as well, because in the past, we wouldn't even be aware that that had happened. But now we can, we can, um, we can track that evicted loon. And, and Tiffany has brought this to a high art on Squam Lake where, where you know, there's just, there's an ongoing saga, soap opera of, of loons on Squam Lake. And Tiffany tracks these birds from territory to territory, figures out who's been kicked out of which territory. And, and, and then they make trouble for the next, you know, pair over and things. And by virtue of having these banded loons so that we can actually identify uh, individuals, uh, we can follow all of these kind of fascinating developments and, uh, and it can impact, you know, breeding success and survival of loons as, as well. So these are, these are interesting things, but they can also be important um, for, the, for the, uh, the continued recovery of the species. There are some comments in here that the chat actually hadn't been working previously. So that's why we weren't getting questions early on. Um, I'm glad to see that it's working now and I'm sorry to anyone who uh, had issues with it. Hopefully everyone is able to access it now to ask questions if you have them. Um, oh, this next question is cool. So um, this person lives near a certain island on Winnipesaukee where there's a floating nest platform um, and has never seen the loon pair nest on it. Um, actually, so at that particular territory, the loons nested on that raft for the first time in recorded history just this past year. Uh, prior to that, they would nest. So we have that raft in a tiny little cove on this island and the loons would nest on the island right next to the raft or right behind the raft. And they'd fail and they'd fail and they fail. Um, and this past year, they actually decided to nest on the raft and they hatch chicks. Yeah, so, um, but the rest of the question is, are these nests ever removed to a new location? And so, yes, if there's a raft that uh, the loons just have showed no interest in for several years, then we might take it and put it somewhere else where it might actually have a chance of being used. Uh -huh. Okay, so this one says, on Winnipesaukee last August, neighbors and I thought we saw three adult loons hanging out in a group. It seemed odd, but does that happen? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, yes, you, um, you know, at different times of the year, you will see groupings of, of loons. If it happened early in the summer, um, a lot of times what will happen is that you will have loons that are, they may be young loons, they've never had a territory, they may have lost a territorial battle and be, been kicked out of their territory. They will be prospecting, right? They'll be looking for a new territory and a new opportunity 
uh, to take over a, a territory. If they can, if they find themselves in an empty, you know, piece, piece of water, that's wonderful. They can do that. But often what will happen with loons is that if they have seen chicks in that territory, you know, even the year before, loons have a good memory for that sort of thing. And, and that by definition, that means that that territory where they saw those chicks is a good territory. And that attracts loons who are intruding and who are wanting to challenge you know, if it's a male loon coming in, he will, he will be challenging the male. If it's a female, she will be challenging the female because they know that that's a quality territory. And if they have an opportunity to take that over um, from, from their counterpart, uh, then they may be successful there as, as well. And, and so early in the season, if you see these three loons, what it can often be is your resident pair plus one of those intruding loons. And, and we used to see that and we, and we used to think, oh, how nice, you know, the loons are having a little coffee clutch and, and isn't this wonderful. But, you know, now we know that this is a, this is a test. And, and, um, and so this would, the intruding bird is going to be sizing up its counterpart and trying to, to figure out if it might be able to successfully evict that loon. And, and, um, and that member of the territorial pair is going to be uh, displaying, you know, through sometimes through dramatic um, displays and, and thrashing around in the water and penguin dancing and things of that nature, or there are other displays like rushing on the water. And, and that loon is trying to convince this intruding loon that if you're looking for an easy mark and wanting to take over this territory, keep looking because you're not going to, you know, you're not going to easily wrest this territory away from me. Uh, and, and if it's successful in convincing this intruding loon that it doesn't want to tangle uh, with you, then the intruding loon goes, goes off and, and uh, looks for another territory that it may be able to now, if it's towards the end of the summer, that's a different story because when loons first arrive on their on their lakes, um, you know the hormone levels are, are sky high and it's all about fighting and 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 uh, you know securing a territory and mating and nesting and raising those chicks. But as the summer wears on, those hormone levels begin to you know think everything begins to calm down a little bit. And loon pairs have either been successful; they've raised their chicks to a point where those chicks are now able to take care of themselves and they don't need constant supervision, or if unfortunately they've lost their chicks, you know, that pair has just kind of been hanging out on their, on their territory through the summer. Uh, and you have maybe, you know, perhaps neighboring loons that begin to come around um, or even young of the year that may be coming around and, and loons begin to become more tolerant of one another. And they'll just kind of group together um, and they'll hang out, you know, for a little bit um, and, and do some, you know, fishing and, and things, and it'll be kind of a calmer situation. So as the summer wears into fall, you'll go from three or four or six loons to sometimes like, you know, 16 or 20 loons that you can see in these big rafts of, of loons. And then one day when the weather seems right and, and these environmental cues like decreasing daylight have told them, you know, that they get anxious um, and, and something is telling them that it's time to leave this lake and, and fly off to the ocean. And, you know, one day they'll just all be gone and they'll never fly, you know, coordinated as like a V with a, with geese or anything of that nature. But when the weather conditions are, are right, um, they will just kind of take off and, and all head to the ocean and we won't see them again until the uh, lakes break up and it's springtime. Uh, the next question is in the Northeast, where is the southernmost nesting location? Uh, this person lives in New Jersey and wishes that they nested there. Um, the southernmost location that I'm aware of is that one pair that nests in Connecticut, right? And I think it's towards the southern boundary of Connecticut. I don't know that they've ever actually hatched a chick, but I know that they've been documented nesting. Right. There was some nesting. And my, and my recollection, Caroline, was that it might have been in the northwestern side of, oh. of Connecticut. So up in the highlands there. And, and, um, and so, again, the climate is a little bit cooler uh, there and, and you know as as we have really delved into um, loons and, and loon populations we're really beginning to think that temperature does play a critical role in determining that southern boundary of, of loons and so uh, you know we do have some loons that are nesting in the Quabbin and the Wachusett reservoirs in, in Massachusetts and they're actually expanding their population into lakes surrounding um, that but as you keep on going further into into Massachusetts um, you're not seeing very many loons. Um, and again, in Western Massachusetts, there's the highlands there, and that's like the Monadnock Highlands, so it's a little bit cooler um, up in there. But as you get into Southeastern Massachusetts, you know, our thought is that you're not, you're no longer looking at good loon breeding habitat. Uh, and the danger, of course, is, is that as our climate continues to warm, that southernmost limit of where loons can successfully 
carry on a viable population is going to continue to creep north. So um, that's our that's certainly our fear, um, and and that's the reason why uh, we're doing a lot of research, both looking through our database at how temperature and and weather events affect loon nesting here in New Hampshire, um, and that's also the focus of Caroline's um, research uh, about you know putting covers over some of our rafts and things to see if we can't provide these loons with a little bit of shade um, and a little bit of temperature mitigation that uh, may help them overcome the effects of some of these heat waves that we're now seeing pretty regularly rolling through New Hampshire. Um, the next question is, are loons monogamous? Do they mate for life? Yes, yeah, so here's a question. So yes, I mean, conventional wisdom, right, was that loons uh, mate for life and we even have like an older um, video that we like to play still at the Loon Center because it's a really good video about, about Loon um, natural history and, and things. But there's that one piece that always makes us cringe where it says Loons are thought to mate for, for life. And, and, and here's where, you know, banding has taught us a little bit um, about Loons and, and Loon history. And so before we banded Loons, yes, that was a conventional wisdom. Now that we have banded Loons and can follow their movements, um, we've had to change that answer, you know, a little bit. So I say, you know, typically I say a little tongue in cheek that loons are like humans, right? Some, some do and some don't when it comes to that whole uh, mating for life question. But really, frankly, for loons, most don't. Um, and you can have uh, a string of years, you know, where you have the same mated pair. And if they're successful and if they're raising chicks, then typically, you know, they're more likely to pair up again the next year. Um, but we don't have any evidence that when loons leave our, our lakes, they're actually overwintering in the same area. So, and I've also heard it said, you know, maybe one of the, the, um, the keys to a good long, just a long, you know, term relationship is, is separate winter vacations. And so uh, when these loons come back, uh, often they will come back to the same lake. And if everything is copacetic, you may very well have the same pair of loons on the lake. But as Caroline was saying, if one of them is evicted, you know, from the territory, or if one of them, you know, perishes on the ocean and doesn't come back, the other one will find a new mate, you know, and it will carry on. And that just makes biological sense, you know, to, to uh, continue. Um, not necessarily a question, but a comment in response to uh, the whole rafting loons uh, thing that you were just talking about. So a few springs ago, we had a dozen loons on a small lake in Western New York for about a week. I heard that they were grounded while migrating due to the weather. Right, sure, yeah, absolutely. And isn't it interesting, right, to think where those loons might have been going. So even if they were common loon, may have, they may have well been going up into, you know, northern Saskatchewan or someplace uh, uh, up there into the Northwest Territories or, or uh, something of, of that nature. So um, that's an interesting uh, observation, great. Um, there is a question about how the loons are doing in the Adirondacks. So uh, we only monitor in New Hampshire, but there's a great organization, the Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation, um, that do the monitoring in, on the Adirondack Lake. So definitely check them out. You can search them um, to yeah, learn about the work that they're doing and about how the Adirondack loon population is doing. Absolutely, yes. And they even actually have an Adirondack Loon Center um, up there as, as well. So Nina Schock is the head of that organization. She's a veterinarian, so and she's um, very involved in, in uh, loon banding and mercury studies up in the Adirondacks. So that's it's a great program that they have and definitely worth checking out. Yeah, and when they do their loon rescues, Nina will sometimes do the, uh, the rehabbing herself because she's trained right. in that too, which is cool. Yeah. Um, when do loons begin to group up in rafts prior to migrating? Boy, it's sort of a big range of time, right? Um, any, yeah. you know, you'll see those rafts anywhere from late August through October, I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's an individual thing, you know, as, as well. So some loons are, are a little bit more tolerant of, of uh, neighbors and, and things than others. It depends a little bit, um, you know, on the broads on Winnipesaukee, there's really no islands there. There's no shoreline. So it's not good nesting habitat, but you will see loons just kind of hanging out, you know, there in the, in the broads. So it depends, it's a little bit, it can be a little bit different from lake to lake um, as, as well. But if you're talking about pre-migratory staging groups and when loons are, are typically migrating in the fall, uh, again, it's, it's pretty protracted. And we think probably there may be, there may very well be a few loons that by the end of August, you know, is if they don't have chicks, um, they're saying that's it, they're, they're out of there and they're back to the ocean. 
and some loons will stay right to the end of December or early January. Um, and, and those are the ones sometimes that make us nervous because then, you know, lakes are beginning to ice in. And if you can get a, a quick freeze in of those lakes, that's what can cause a loon to be stranded. So it, all of a sudden it finds itself without that water runway that it needs to take off. Uh, and then the ice continues to close in, close in, close in. And we really have to wait until that, that bird is in only about, you know, maybe 10 feet of open water, you know, of a hole before we have a chance of being able to go in there and, and rescue it. Um, and, uh, and at that point as well, this is where eagles may, you know, may come in because if a loon gets entirely iced in, if that, if that even that last 10 feet pulls us up, then that loon finds itself on the ice and it is easy prey for an eagle to come down and, and you know, dispatch it. Um, and even if it's, you know, restricted to a small area of open water, um, if, if an eagle is, it perches itself right at the edge of that open water, that loon will come up, take a quick breath of air, and then, and then dive again to get rid of that eagle, but it's a matter of time, right? And, and some of these eagles are smart enough to know that after a while, that loon is going to be exhausted, it's going to get uh, slow enough that if an eagle times it exactly right, um, as that loon comes up for air, it can sink a talon, you know, into it and pull it up on the ice, which is, you know, which is all, which is kind of grim as, as well. Um, so, but that, I mean, that's, that's fall um, migration and most of these loons get off just fine and get off to the ocean um, as, as well, but it's a pretty long and drawn out affair. And spring migration, in contrast, is, is, uh, is very, is very short. Um, and a lot of times, you know, the lake won't even be entirely free of ice and somebody will be hearing a loon calling on that lake. And so there, there's always this big question about how do, they, how do they know? How do these loons know within hours of ice out, I've got a loon, you know, down on my lake and, and it's calling. And it's been interesting because we've now figured out that um, as, our, as our lakes begin to open up, as the days get longer, you know, these loons that are, that are floating out in the ocean, they're triggered, you know, there's that innate instinct to start to fly inland and just see if there's open water. And what these loons will do is they'll fly in and if there's open, if there's enough open water, they'll land. And if there's not, they'll turn around and they'll fly back to the ocean. But then they'll repeat that every day. So there's, uh, so we think, you know, there's a real value to a loon being the first one down on that lake, especially if it's his old territory. And as soon as that bird is is down, it's uh, and if it's a male, he's calling, you know, giving that yodel call, which is that territorial call uh, of the loon. And essentially, he's claiming dibs on that lake. And after that, anybody who wants that piece of water. Has to fight him for it. And so there's a real advantage to being in early. And, and so that's why you've got loons on a lake within hours. Um, and of course, we, we didn't talk at all uh, about the calls of, of loons, but there's a whole section on LBC's website uh, at loon.org about loon calls. And we go through the four, those four main types of calls. Um, and there's, there's clips of each of them, along with an explanation of what those different calls mean. And, and so I encourage everybody to check it out because it really is pretty fascinating and these loons have really evolved kind of a, a, a complex and beautiful language, right? And we appreciate it, but they're not calling for our benefit. They're mostly calling to, to communicate with other loons. Um, and it's kind of neat to find out what it is that they're saying to each other. Um, and then the last question that we have is in the chat is, is there a loon center in New Hampshire? Yes, um, it's our headquarters. We're located in Moultonboro on Lees Mill Road. Um, we have been closed for construction since August, but we're that's just about wrapped up now. We've expanded the Loon Center, we've improved it, uh, and we're excited to welcome visitors back this spring and summer. Yeah. Great. All Great. Right. Yeah, we're at the end of our questions. We are. So no more questions. Great. All right. Well, fantastic. So, uh, Caroline, thank you for putting this series together. I think it's it's a it's a great thing. I'm I'm always sorry that we can't be you know with our our uh, interested people and our supporters in person. Um, but but uh, doing this you know social through the social networking and, and things. Well, that's the next best thing. So um, so this has been great, and uh, and I'm glad that it's going to be on our YouTube channel as well for anybody who wants to catch it later. Um, and there we are. Good. Yeah, and I just like to add that I saw a lot of um, names in the chat that I recognize who are volunteers with LPC and help us do our work, who have, you know, people who have helped us with rescues, people who have helped us float rafts and signs. So thank you all so much. We couldn't do the work that we do without you. Um, and thank you yeah. for being here with us tonight. Great. We appreciate you all. Good. All right. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Good. Thank you. Bye, everyone.